I'm John Craddock. I work out of the UK, but I work pretty much all over the place. A um, lot, lot of work in Europe and beyond. And I figured out the other day, this is actually my 20th year of presenting at international conferences. I thought, 20 years in the game, hmm, interesting. Anyway, I'm really, really pleased to be here. So let's get on with the session. And as I say, it's about throwing away your DMZ. Well, perhaps not throwing it away, because I don't expect you to chuck it out the door and say, we don't need it anymore. For those who already got one, I think it's a sort of matter of shaking it off a little bit gently. You know, shake it off. And that's the whole idea is when we start looking at deploying new applications, how are we going to do it? So what I want to cover, first of all, is having a look at what are the challenges of a DMZ, or as I would say, a DMZ, but then I am from the UK. And then you might not even understand what I was talking about, so we'll call it DMZ. So the, the DMZ challenges. Then I want to introduce the Azure AD application proxy. And while I'm doing that, I'm also going to just go into my version or my take on the Azure AD. And probably this week, you've seen a lot of corporate slides showing you what the Azure AD is going to do for you. I'm going to just take a slightly different stance on it with my mix of slides. Um, and then we'll look at publishing applications. How do we publish applications? Uh, what is pre-authentication? And how do we use it? And why should we use it? And then how do we start getting single sign-on and maybe to a legacy application that is using Windows integrated authentication? How do we deal with that? And then you've got claims aware applications and you might have you know, WS Fed apps, but you're more likely these days to have using modern authentication pro protocols such as OpenID Connect. So how do we integrate all that together? So first of all, let's start off with just a quick think about the DMZ challenges. Hardware costs. It is expensive to build a really good DMZ, especially if you want to have load balancing on the front end, load balancing to servers inside. You then want to deal with you know, denial of service protection, intrusion detection, and so it goes on. It can get very, very expensive to implement. And then I've written down maintaining security. Because I have maybe, I think, sometimes a slightly naive faith that is when you design your DMZ, you get it right. And you've really got your, your thinking hats on and you get the security right. And then everything's great. And then you deploy your first application into it. And someone says, I need that firewall open. So you open that firewall. And then something else gets deployed. And somebody else needs another firewall port open. So that gets open. And then someone says, actually, do you know what we need? It's an RODC inside the DMZ. And before you know it, your DMZ is suffering from what I call Swiss cheese syndrome. It's got little holes in it all over the place. And it is really difficult to maintain and expensive to keep in really tip-top condition. And then someone says, well, actually, do you know what? I don't want anyone in coming in to the network unless they've been authenticated right at the edge. All right? So nobody even comes into the DMZ until they've been authenticated. So how do we deal with that? Where's the authentication mechanism to deal with that? I mean, there are various ways we can do it, but it's not easy. And then we've got all these web apps or web services inside the DMZ. How are we going to authenticate users to them? And someone says, ah, that's why we put in the RODC. All right? Or maybe we have some other sort of database sitting out there, maybe with 500 million users on it, with 500 million passwords. And suddenly it gets compromised. All right, so that's a real challenge. And then, of course, VPN access. How do we maintain that? There's a lot of work to do if we're going to implement our own DMZ. Now, the Azure AD application proxy can solve a lot of these problems. But what I put in here is a couple of bits of customer evidence. The Bristow Group, they have a very mobile workforce that's looking after all those great whirly birds of theirs. And they actually are now using the Azure Active Directory application proxy, 
And what they feel is it gives them a secure solution to allow their mobile workforce to ap access the applications they need. And the interesting thing in there I want to take away from this slide is without using a virtual private network, all right? And then they do say, or other device. We go to another company, which is Unilever. They've now got 200 on-prem apps published out through the application proxy. Notice they use the form app proxy. That's banned. I'm not allowed to call it the app proxy. I have to call it the Windows Azure Active Directory Application Proxy. The only thing I'm allowed to shorten is Active Directory to AD. I can't use AAD. It has to be Azure AD. But there are customers that are there allowed to do that. And there, again, the real takeaway one is getting access to these apps without the need for a VPN, right? So there are two very significant bits of feedback from customers. So what is this thing? It's a thing. I can't say more than that. It's a service sitting up in the cloud. How is it implemented? You don't need to know. You're not allowed to know, all right? But what it does is it exposes a public IP, and we can have an external URL where we can get to that public IP. And what happens is the client comes to the proxy in the sky, and then what happens is it tunnels down through a secure channel to an endpoint for a connector. So what we have is a connector that runs from the cloud down to on-premise. And on-premise, it can run inside our corporate network, and it's running on a server there, and this, it terminates the secure channel, okay? And at that point, we go out from that connector and actually connect to the published website. Now, we can deploy multiple connectors for full tolerance and also performance. And so what we could do is we could have a bunch of web servers sitting in one data center. We could create a connector, and we could have multiple connectors inside a connector group. And they're all coming down and to the applications sitting in that one data center. Alternatively, we could have multiple data centers, and then we could have multiple connector groups. So when we come in through the thing, whatever it is, in the Azure cloud, what we'll do is we'll connect down through the appropriate connector group. So connector groups are really important when you're thinking about the topology of your design. But Azure AD, this is my take. This is not corporate slide set. It's an identity store. It's sitting up in the cloud, and you put your data in it. So you manage the data. And of course, the main piece of data is your users and your groups and various other bits and pieces. You manage that. Microsoft manage absolutely everything else. So it's high availability, it's ability to prevent denial of service attacks, it's ability to authenticate. Actually, I'm not gonna go into the figures because you've probably all heard those already, the numbers, all right? But it's sitting up there in the cloud. How do we get our users in it? How do we configure it? Well, there's actually two management portals and there's also API sets. So you have REST APIs and you have graph APIs where we can get in and manage it. So we could programmatically create all the users we wanted up in the cloud. Or we can take our on-premise users and we can sync those into the cloud. So we synchronize from our on-premise AD up into the cloud. And how many of you went to the Azure AD Connect session? So, ooh, about probably 15% of the audience, if that. Okay, so it's Azure AD Connect that does that connection. So taking our on-premise users, synchronizing them up in the cloud, synchronizing the groups, uh, synchronizing hashes of the passwords, and all sorts of other bits and pieces. But I'm not going to go into any detail. But. Now, having got that, what does it give us? It opens a whole new world to our users. They can authenticate to practically anything. So they could authenticate to an Azure subscription, but Office 365. So if you have Office 365, you already have an Azure Active Directory. And we can open it up to add additional functionality. 
But we can also go to your apps. Where are your apps? They might be on-premises. They might be in a cloud service of some kind that you've purchased. It might be in a private cloud. So it could be in a public cloud. It could be in a private cloud of yours. We can go to partner apps. So we can authenticate to them. And we can authenticate to a whole raft of SaaS apps which come out of a gallery. And what's the great thing about it? Azure AD is our identity store. Once you've logged on there, once, you are authenticated against all of these other applications. So we've got single sign-on, one log-on into the Azure AD, and we've got single sign-on absolutely everywhere. The two portals. There is the old portal. Sorry, I have to correct myself. There is the classic portal. And then there is the new portal, all written in HTML5. It really is a nice, exciting portal to use. However, this functionality you can see here for the Azure AD was only switched on on the 22nd of this month. All right, so it's literally just gone into public preview. And some of the things for the Azure AD you cannot do in the new portal yet. All right, so you have to revert back to the old portal. But if you think about it, all the innovation is going to be done in the new portal. So new features that come out will be probably just in the new portal. They may not be put in the old portal, sorry, the classic portal at all. Um, we're going to have to use the classic portal because the moment in terms of dealing with the application proxy, we can't do, we can do a little bit through the new portal, but not very much. But, you know, Azure AD is way, way more than a, an identity store. It gives us the ability of doing password resets for our users. We've got self-service. So a, a user wants to get to an application. They can self-service to it. They can self-service group membership. And we can have workflow. Multi-factor authentication. Just turn it on. And we've got our users using multi-factor authentication. Really detailed reporting and auditing. And if we went for the B2C service, you'd have user enrollment as well. And part of all this is the Azure AD application proxy. And there's a lot more features as well, which I don't have time to, to cover. And this is not an Azure AD session. So we're going to concentrate on that proxy. So our prerequisites for the Azure AD proxy is number one, you require Azure AD basic or premium. OK, um, so there's free, there's basic, and there's premium. And now there's two versions of premium, premium one and premium two. And everyone scratches their head and said, what do you get with each one? And you look on the Microsoft site, it's been really difficult to tell until. Have you watched a, a session by Nassos? All right, he has done the most wonderful table, which actually now shows you all the features. And there's the link to it. So you've got all the features, and also you can link from there to pricing, and it will tell you exactly what it costs and how you get it. Okay? So this new Premium 1 and 2 are very, very new indeed. It just used to be called Premium. And then the connector has to be installed on Windows Server 2012 R2 or higher. Now, just be slightly suspicious of the O or higher today. So if you went back and you started deploying today onto the or higher, which would be 2016, which is only just hit RTM, then there may be, uh, there may be some hiccups. There may not be. Okay, that's the, the full regression testing is just being completed, being completed at the moment. Okay, so I would go, if you want to do it, as soon as you get back to the office, I would do it on 2012 R2. Um, and then you can install it on the client if you wanted to for test purposes. To be honest, I wouldn't bother, but I just put that in there for completeness. And then you've got the on-premise firewall. Uh, you need to just enable outbound traffic. Right? The connections are all done going outbound, so the initiation of the connection. We don't need to open any inbound ports to allow connections to take place. And there's a nice little uh, uh, website you can go to, which is testport.cloudapp.net. And what that will do is it will just check that you've got the appropriate outbound connectivity on all of the appropriate ports. 
How do we get the connector itself? We download that from the Azure portal. And you install it, and then you register it with your Azure AD tenant. And if you're not familiar with the name tenant, when you create an instance of a, an Azure AD that is referred to as a tenant, you will have to have a, a unique tenant name, which is unique across all tenants. And then um, in part of that, there's a troubleshooter. So it'll actually do some troubleshooting, which is a good idea when it's actually doing the install. And my mouse is being a little bit slow. Um, that's the required outbound ports. I'm not going to go through the list in any detail. The, the interesting one there is the 9352 and the 5671. Uh, you don't actually need if you're using a forward proxy to go out. Um, watch this space, basically. That is, is as it is today. You'll probably find the number of ports required shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until maybe you're just left with 443. But at the moment, that is what you need today. Two services are installed. So on the, on the server that is running the connector itself, and that is the service which actually runs the connector, and then there's an updater service as well. OK, so we go up to the portal. We have to actually enable the application proxy. We also need to be using a basic, or we need to be using premium. So we've got, we, if we're using free, we're not going to get this capability. So having gone and enabled it, we can download the connector, we can install the connector, and then we're ready to publish applications. So we currently do it via the classic portal. And you need to specify a name, and that name needs to be unique within your tenant you will need to specify an internal URL for your application, right? And you'll have to decide whether you want to use pre-authentication. So what is pre-authentication? Well, you imagine the client is connecting in, and the client connects to the public IP sitting up on the whatever it is in the cloud that is running the proxy up in the cloud. And what it will do is it will either pass you through doing its proxy bit, so header translation, if that's what you've got enabled, pass you straight through to your application, or it will say, you can't come through here unless you're authenticated. And guess who authenticates you? It's the Azure AD. So you'll do the authentication against the Azure AD. And then once you've authenticated, you will then come through to the application, and it's entirely up to the application to decide how you authenticate to the application itself. So all users that are going to connect through the proxy have got to be assigned a basic or a premium license. And you will also need to assign them to actually use the proxy application that you've published. So you've got the application on premise, and then you've got the proxy application sitting up in the Azure cloud. And what we'll need to do is assign the user to, do that, to that. And you can do it directly for the user, or you can do it via a group. So we can assign it to a group. But you do need the licensing as well. So I haven't actually talked about the external URL yet. Well, you get an automatic default external URL. And what it is, it's the name of the application, which is unique within your tenant. But remember, this is now a public URL that needs to be unique everywhere. All right? So what it does is it takes the name, and then it tacks on your tenant name. And your tenant name is whatever you decide is what it's going to be when you create your directory. And you choose a tenant name, and you say test. And it will come up with a little red mark saying, you can't have test because somebody else has already got it. All right. So what you do is you have to choose something unique as a tenant name. So now the concatenation of name and tenant name gives you a unique host name. And that's so it's HTTPS followed by the unique host name dot msapproxy.net. OK. And you might say, I don't like that. I want to use my own external URL. And absolutely, you can. But what you'll need to do is add your domain name, 
into Azure AD and you will have to verify your ownership of it. And you do that via text records. So it'll tell you what text records to add and you'll go off and add those and then it'll accept that as that you own that domain. If you do that, you will then have to set up your own certificates into Azure. Right? There is a default certificate, which is star.msapproxy.net. So the default URLs can all use HTTPS, and there's a certificate available for them. If we go for pass-through, and we're going for pass-through on here, what will happen is we come to the external URL. We hit the proxy in the cloud, and what it will do is it will say, ah, pass through. I'll let you straight through to your internal URL that you've defined. Okay? And what it does is it passes it down through the appropriate connector. So that the, and the connector groups are associated with an application. So it will load balance across the connectors within the connector group and choose the connect, correct connector group for that application. It arrives down at the connector endpoint and what the endpoint's going to do is then do an HTTPS or an HTTP connection to your application. Right? So all that's happening here with path through is it's doing its role as a proxy, and of course it's doing the host header translation as well. Okay, so I want to start off with a demo on here, and I just switch over on here. And what I've got is I'm, I'm working at the moment on my Windows 10 box, and I'm going to go across to this Windows Auth app, and it's a demonstration app, and um, what, I, what I've got in here is I've got a, a very simple app which is currently using Anonymous, so there is no authentication to it. Now, I'm not going through the proxy, I'm not doing anything, I'm on my corporate network, and I'm gaining access to it, and my internal URL, which you can see in there, is actually windowsauth.example.com. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to actually test this guy out on the internet, so I'm gonna move it over to my uh, virtual internet, so from the London network, I'm going to go over to my uh, virtual internet on here. So we'll OK that, just take that up, fill the screen, and then what we'll do is we'll try again. And of course, it fails, because it's not published out onto the internet at this stage. OK, so if we go across to the uh, DC, we can actually, I've logged into the classic portal, and what I can see is my various directories that I've got. And let's just choose the msc1a directory. And if we go across to the configuration on here, what I can look at is the configuration that I've actually got. And it'll take time to whirl away for a little bit, and I can do my group configuration, pos password policy reset, all sorts of bits and pieces. But what I'm looking for is the application proxy. So here we can see the application proxy is actually enabled. And if I want to install it, where do I get the connector from? I actually go down here to download now, and I can look at my current connectors. Well, I just have, at the moment, I just have a connector. Actually, let me just ask, at the back road, can you actually see that, or do I need to zoom in? Zoom in? No zoom in? How many, how many hands up for zoom in? Okay, right, that's enough. <laughs> okay, so this is my connector here. Um, it's, it's sitting, the endpoint is sitting on a server called msc-srv.example.com, and there's the IP for the, the, the connector itself, the endpoint in the cloud, and then I've got the group, and I'm just using a default group on there. Okay, so if we close off that, that's the connector itself, and what I just want to do is look at the endpoint that I've got it on, which is my server over here, which happens to be running the IIS servers as well, and we just look at the, that, and if I go to computer management, and I go down to services and applications, services, and we look down here, and what we can see is we've got the app 
uh, AAD, Application Proxy Connector, and we've also got the updater. Now, what I can do is actually I can go to, um, if I go down here to Internet Explorer, I've already run this test, which is testport.cloudapp.net. And it's just given me a verification that all those ports that were on the slide are actually open and working and available. So those are all remember, outbound ports. There are no inbound ports on this. So we can now go across. And what we're looking for here now is applications. And I'm going to create my proxy. So I'm going to go add, and I'm going to publish an application that will be accessible from outside of your network. OK, so we'll choose that option. And we actually had this on a slide, but what we'll do is now configure this. So we need a name. So I'm going to publish this Windows Auth application. So it seems a good idea to call it Windows Auth. And of course, it's the proxy endpoint. So the Windows Auth app is actually sitting inside my corporate network. I need an internal URL. So by the way, the green flash that just came up is just saying that Windows Auth proxy is unique within my tenant. So that's fine. So windowsauthapp.com. And I'm not going to use pre-authentication at this moment. We'll come back to that. So we'll OK that. And that will whirl away for a little bit. And then we can go to the configuration. So once that's complete, and we go to configure it. And what we'll see is the external URL that has been automatically created for us. So it's Windows Auth Proxy, which was the name dash. That's my tenant ID. Sorry, let's do that for the people at the back. So we've got Windows Auth Proxy dash XTS MSC. The, that, that bit there is my tenant ID and then msproxy.net. Um, so that's that bit there. So let's go, let's go grab that. So I'm going to grab that. And I'm going to go over in a second and use it. But before that, just have a look. Those are the additional domains I can add in. And, and you may think, what strange domain names? Uh, I happen to run a, a masterclass on uh, uh, Azure Identity. And we have multiple domains running in the class. And this is a way I can have lots of different domain names uh, off the, just hung off the xtshub.com. So this is my 1.ad. Um, and, and the usernames are a little bit strange as well, but that's the reason for it. OK, let's uh, just pop over here and let's give it a go. So let's drop that in, which was the external URL. And that's it. So in that sort of seven minutes or so, What's actually happened is we've taken an application that was inside our corporate network, and we've now published it out through the Azure cloud all right, with all of its denial of service attack and everything else that's happening. But at the moment, it's published, and it's all just got, there's no pre-authentication taking place. So what we need to do is go back and actually think about how we can then actually get pre-authentication on here. So if we want to add pre-authentication, we're going to come knock, knock, knocking at the door, and it's going to say, you can't come through. I've got pre-authentication switched off. So what's going to happen is we're going to get a redirect up to the Azure AD. And we're going to authenticate against that Azure AD. We're going to authenticate as, against, as a user against that Azure AD. Question is, where does that user come from? I could have put the user in using the portal. I could have put the user in using PowerShell and one of the APIs or some other programmatic way. So I could have done that. Or I could have synced all my on-premise users up into the cloud. So I've got that capability of doing that. So we knock on the door. We go up to the Azure. We log in as one of the users up there. And what it will do is it then redirect us back 
to the proxy. All right, and the proxy will say, ha ha, thank you very much. I've got the token now for Azure that proves you're an authenticated user. I will let you through. And then we come th straight through, through the connector endpoint, into the corporate network, and the application says, hmm, I'll have to decide whether you're authenticated or not. Nothing from Azure AD will tell it. It has to do its own authentication. So if you want to do the sync, um, I've just put a, a, just one slide in there to remind you about the sync, and we use the, um, the Azure Active Directory Connect to actually do the synchronization. And it sort of gets more and more and more and more sophisticated. So it's a really good synchronization connector. And you've got the, the ability to synchronize the password hashes up as well. But equally well, if you use password reset in the cloud, you can get the password to be synced back onto your AD and all sorts of other bits and pieces. So let's just have a look at the pre-authentication flow. All right? We come knocking on the door. Let me in. It says, you're not authenticated. How does Azure know you're not authenticated? Or put another way, if you were authenticated, how would you tell Azure? No, not ADFS, because we, 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 we might be doing totally without ADFS. An authentication token, you're very close, but they're more yummy than that. Yeah, thank you very much. I like cookies. All right, so you would have an authentication cookie that proves your authentication. So we are redirected with a, a, an authentication string, and it's actually using OpenID Connect. We then end up at the Azure AD, and again, passing the authentication string, and we are put in our username, put in our password, and at that point, we will then be authenticated. So what it's going to do, it's going to do two things. It's going to set a cookie to say that you are authenticated to Azure AD, and it's going to pass back a token, all right, which actually is a token which proves to the application proxy that you are a genuine authenticated user. And that's a JSON web token. All right? There is another method of doing this. And I wrote, a, oh, probably a year ago now, or longer, I wrote a, the, a troubleshooting guide for the Azure application proxy. I've got a link right at the back end of the slides. Um, I show a different flow for this. I actually show a thing called code flow. This is ID token flow. In my original guide, I had ID token flow, and the program manager said, no, we're going over to code flow. So I changed it. Um, at the moment, the, with the transition is not complete. So most people are on ID token flow. So this is correct for most people. There are some people on code flow, and what's shown in the white paper is correct for them. Uh, hopefully, we'll get that updated this year. Anyway, now that token gets presented back. Uh, it's, a, as I said, a JSON web token. It gets posted back to Azure. And what Azure will do is it validates it. And what it's going to do, it's going to look inside there, and it's going to say, oh, when was it issued? Oh, that's OK. When can it be used? Oh, has it expired? And then it will say, is the signature good? All right? And if it passes all these token tests, it accepts the data or the assertions that are on that token. And one of those assertions will be that you're John or whoever you are. All right? And it says, OK, I'm going to let you through. So what it does is it actually gives you a redirect back to the application. But it sets an edge access cookie. So now we come flying back as a result of that redirect to the application. We pass that edge access cookie, which proves all right, to the application proxy that we're authenticated. All right? It's a different cookie to the orange one up there. The orange one there proves you're authenticated to Azure AD. That green one proves you're authenticated to the application proxy. So now we come flying through to the application, and the application says, you're not authenticated. And we've got to do something about that. Or it may say, I'm anonymous. That's fine. Here you are. Here's your page. Right? But 
the application needs to make its own authentication decisions. So that's the basic flow that takes place. So what I'd like to, to show you is actually turning that on. So let's uh, go over here. So I'm going to turn on pre-authentication. So we we'll just close that off, and then we're going to go across to the uh, Azure AD, and we're going to go change that from no authentication or pass through to Azure Active Directory. OK, we let that whirl away for a little bit. And then we'll go back, and let's give this a try now. OK, so a number of things have happened here. As part of that authentication string, we've identified the tenant. And this happens to be my branded tenant. All right, so I've hit, I've hit the external URL. It says you're not authenticated. Why? Because you don't have a cookie. All right, and at this point, it's given me a redirect string. But in that redirect string, we've actually identified the tenant. All right, so it's come up to the XTS hub here. So I can actually do the, the login process here. So I'm going to log in as this character, John. Oh, it's failed. And you start reading this. Status code forbidden. OK, what does that mean? It's got a URL. It's got a tra transaction ID. It's got a timestamp. Ah, the useful bit of information is right at the end. Look at that. Authorization failed. Make sure to assign the user with access to this application. And I haven't done that. So what I'll need to do is actually go back to the portal to actually set that up. So we'll go back to the portal. And if we go, go up to the top here, what we'll find is users and groups. I'm going to make life easy for myself. Um, I'm actually just going to assign it directly to a user. Um, by the way, when, I, when I'm sort of testing things, I, I like to have it as simple as possible, you know, so there's no, no confusion at going through a group and knowing that the user's in the group and everything else. I'm actually just going to assign it directly to my user. So let's find John Williams. There he is. OK, so that's done. Now, let's see if anyone was listening. We've assigned him. We've actually assigned him here to the application, right? But he may not be able to get in to the application. Why? License. license. Well done, sir. So the license, we also need a license. So what it actually does is it authenticate. We get back to the proxy. It checks, next thing is it checks whether you have access, and then it checks if you have a license. So where do we license this guy up? Um, what we can, if we go back over here to our directory itself, which is the MSC1A directory, and if we go over to licenses, what we can see is that we've actually got, we've got 100 licenses here, only six are assigned. It's EMS, which includes the premium directory. And if we look at the assigned users, there's John Williams, and he has a license. So that's good. So let's now see if things work. So again, we're going to go across here to the proxy. We've hit John, and we log in as John. And we've arrived at our application. So now you can't even get on the network right, until you've been authenticated. So we got the edge pre-authentication. But we're still flying through to the app. Right? And it's now down to the app to decide how we authenticate. So let's move on with the story. And how does that app authenticate? Well, it could do it in all sorts of different ways. It could do it uh, anonymous. Well, that's not authentication, is it? It just allows you in. Uh, forms. It could be forms. It could be basic. It could be digest. It could be 
NTLM v2, but don't use NTLM unless there is absolutely no other way to support your application. Right? It will do it, but for sort of because it's to get you out of a hole. You've got a legacy app, and that's the only thing it does. NTLM, by the way, will not do single sign-on. So Kerberos constrained delegation is another way of doing it, and that will do single sign-on. And then we can have claims aware applications. They could be using a WS Federation, they could be using SAML, or they could be using OpenID Connect right, as the authentication mechanism. Why isn't OAuth 2 there? Well, OAuth 2 is really about a, dele it's a delegation. It's an authorization protocol. So with OAuth 2, we authorize one application to access another service on behalf of a user, right? So it's not actually doing the authentication. So the, with what we'd be using is OpenID Connect to do the authentication. So if we want to do Windows Auth, and this is what quite a number of people do, they need to support their legacy applications, what we need to do is somehow get a Kerberos token to that guy on the inside. So what will happen is we will actually hit the outside, we go up to Azure AD, right, and then we'll come down through the connector, and what the hell happened at the connector endpoint, you will actually do a KCD, Kerberos Constrained Delegation, with protocol transition, right, and you will do that to your KDC, and what we're going to ask for is a Kerberos token for our user. Right, so we, the connector endpoint knows the username, right, the login name. Uh, I'll come back on that in a second. And what will happen is this guy will inject the Kerberos token into the HTTP header. Right, so now we can use Kerberos against our web application. So that, that's how that piece works. Now, the computer running the connector has to be domain joined. You cannot do Kerberos constrained delegation if it isn't. So that has to be done. In terms of enabling KCD, what you do is you go up and you say, I want to use integrated Windows authentication. Uh, you need to know the SPN, the service principal name, right, of the, which will identify the service actually running the internal application. And then what we've got is an option for the delegated logon identities. And you think, well, what on earth are they for? Well, let's say we've synced from our own AD, and the UPN is john at xtseminars.com, right? And that syncs up into the zero AD, john at xtseminars.com, right? Come down through the connector, right? Doing, and the connector endpoint says, oh, who is it? John at xtseminars.com, right? Ask for a token. Well, the user exists in the Active Directory, so everything works beautifully, all right? Just imagine, though, our own AD is actually xtseminars.local, right? So John's UPN is john at xtseminars.local. Well, you cannot sync that up into the cloud because it's got to be synced up into fully rootable DNS name. So what we can do is we can choose an alternative attribute to use. And the typical one is the mail attribute. So in the mail attribute, I have john at xtseminars.com. So I replicate that up, and that come, becomes my Azure login name. All right? So now we come down, and we got the Azure login name, which is john at xtseminars.com. But what we need to do is we need to translate it to what the original UPN was. And one of the options on there, and I actually can't zoom that screen, one of the options on there is use the on-premises user principal name. And what happens is, when we do the sync, we take the actual on-premises user principal name, xtseminars.local, and we replicate it up into the cloud. So we've got it up there for these situations. So now what's gonna happen is, you logged in as John at xtseminars.com, but when it asks for Kerberos token, it, the user principal will be John at xtseminars.local. And that's what that is. And you might say, well, hang on a minute, what's the username part of the user principal name? Remember, it's not just about Windows Kerberos. 
It could be Kerberos on other systems as well. You might have sort of mixed up with a Linux Kerberos environment or a Unix Kerberos environment, and you might need different ways of actually identifying the, the principle for those environments. So that's why you've got those other options. Okay, um, and then to get the whole thing working, what we need to do is we need to do the Kerberos constraint delegation with the protocol transitioning. So we come in and we set it up, and this is done on the computer that is running the connector. So that's where, where we do that. But before you start, check, you can actually gain access to your application using Kerberos, because if you can't, it ain't gonna work. And so we need to check that the connector can actually connect to the app using Kerberos. So we need to know that we can get there internally. Okay, let's, uh, let's carry on with our sort of building our demo environment. And what we're going to go for now is we're going to actually, um, we, we're, going to, uh, we're going to actually do, sorry, the, um, let me just get this set up. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, we're, we're connected through, we've got pre-authentication, and what we're now going to do is close that off, and I want to go across to my server, and on my server, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the authentication mechanism. So I'm going to turn on Windows authentication, and in here, so I'm going to enable that, and I'm going to disable anonymous authentication. So that's disabled, so now it's gonna use Windows integrated authentication. Okay, so now we go back to the app, and let's go through it now. So we're gonna to go to my WA proxy endpoint. I actually got that saved from earlier. I've already created that shortcut. And we log in as John. This is the pre-authentication, and now we're to the application. And look, it looks a bit obscure. Now, I'm connecting to, let's just zoom that up, connecting to CWAP-WEUR. You're actually connecting to the application, but we're going through the proxy, so you get this rather strange thing. It doesn't look, it's not very comforting to look at that. So we're going in as example, John. And we've ended up actually using NTLM. So, uh, I like to think of NTLM as, no, not the land manager. <laughs> Don't use it, all right? It is really a total fallback position because you, you've got a legacy application that you absolutely need to support, and it's the only way of doing it. So, um, we, but we have authenticated on the internal app. So what we need to do is we need to go and sort it all out, and we need to turn on Kerberos Constraint Delegation. So I'm going back over here, and I'm going to, um, to, first of all, test that I can actually connect to my Windows auth at example.com app. Um, I'm being prompted, um, and actually this is something, again, I do for testing purposes. I disable in the browser the ability to automatically log on on the intranet, and this way you can see the flow way better. So I'm actually now authenticating, but this could have come just straight out of the browser, uh, but I would have actually obviously logged on as to whoever I was logged on to the session as. So I'm logging on as John, and what it's done is done Kerberos, which is exactly what I wanted. So we've got Kerberos working. Okay. Um, if it didn't do Kerberos, I wouldn't even start to go any further. I'd have to fix that first. So I'm going back to my uh, Azure portal. I'm going to find my application, which is the Windows auth proxy application. And I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to configure this guy. Okie doke. So let's go down here. And what we're looking for is the internal authentication mechanism. And I'm going to go for integrated Windows auth. I need to supply the SPN, so it's HTTP WAC, and it's windowsauth.example.com, so that's the 
SPN, the service principal name. And I'm going to, I've, I've, I've got proper user principal names replicated up, so I'm just going to stick with user principal name. But that's where you make your decision, do an alternative. So we'll save that. So that's cooking away. And that has done the work we need to do up in the portal itself. What we need to do now is go to Active Directory Users and Computers. We go to our server, which is running the connector endpoint, and we're going to, in here, delegation. So trust this computer for delegation to specific services. That's the KCD aspect. And then use any authentication protocol that allows me to do the translation from a name into a Kerberos token. And that's the protocol transitioning. And what I'll need to do is, for the Kerberos constraint delegation part, I will need to specify um, the actual SPN that I want to go to. Well, we know it's registered on the server running the endpoint, so we've just got to look for it. So if we come down here and look for it over here, select that. OK, so that's done. So we've done the delegation. We've set it up in Azure AD. Let's see what happens. In we come. We're going to log in as John. Remember, this is pre-authentication. And we're straight into our application using Kerberos. And look what it says. It says server asserted identity. Hmm. How does that contrast with what it said before? Let's go back over that. Okay, it says authentication authority asserted identity. So here, we've actually been authenticated by the KDC. All right? Whereas with the other one, the service has actually gone and got a Kerberos ticket. So that's a media indicator that, uh, of what's going on. So over here, um, on the, uh, we've got the service asserted identity. So who asserted it? It's the connector endpoint that's asserted it. And that's now we've got single sign-on operational. Okay. So that is, and, and a lot of people are actually using sort of, you know, the Windows auth apps, and this gives them a way of actually publishing those applications and with proper single sign-on. Right, let's go back to our slide deck, and let's talk about claims-aware applications. Claims-aware application, as I say, it could be OpenID Connect, it could be... Um, it could be using WS Fed, it could be using SAML, all right? And the claims aware application needs to actually go to an STS, a security token service, or redirect you there to get a, a token, all right? So, what is the security token service? Well, it could be Azure AD, or it could be ADFS, all right? Or it could be some third party security token service. So remember, this is the application that's running on our internal web server that is going to, to do this. So if you want to use OpenID Connect, you're going to have to use ADFS 2016. You can't support it on ADFS running on server 2012 R2. So you, you do need ADFS running on 2016 to be able to do that. So what happens here is if we've got a claimsware application, we need to tell it to redirect people for authentication to an SDS. So one option is to do this. We've got our application, which we've published through the Azure portal. And that application, to get through the portal, we go up to Azure to authenticate. And then the application itself is trusting ADFS. So what's going to happen is we're going to, first of all, go to Azure AD, get through the edge, and then we're going to go to our ADFS internally to get the token for the application. So we're going to be faced with two sign-ons. And, oh, actually, yeah, sorry. So actually what I want to do is I want to do a demo of that. Let me just check that my timing... Yep, that's perfect. So let's do a demo of that. So here, what we're going to do is I'm going to publish a claims-aware application. It's going to be a 
It's going to be an OpenID Connect application. And this OpenID Connect application actually has a relationship for its STS with our ADFS server. So let's actually look at what happens. So here, what we're going to do is first of all move this guy onto my internal network. And by the way, the, uh, the demo environment I use, uh, I've decided uh, it's been matured over the years, and it's sort of the minimum number of servers to have a, a virtual internet and everything else. And I've decided I'm going to update it for the final release of 2016 and then make it available. So if you want to, uh, if you want to listen to my tweet feed, I will tell you where it is available. It'll be about three weeks. And if you want to build that environment so you can do your own testing, uh, it's, it's a very useful environment to do it in. Um, so just going over now, I've moved on. I'm going to go to this thing, which is my a very a, a rather obscure uh, application. Um, it actually is used in the master class, and we can test out all sorts of different flows. So hybrid flow, hybrid flow with admin consent. Um, hybrid flow to a common multi-tenant endpoint, and, and so on. Uh, I'm just going to do hybrid flow with um, just straightforward hybrid flow in this demo. And what it does is it's telling me straight over to my AD ADFS server. Remember, I'm inside my corporate network. So straight over here, I'm going to authenticate as my user, and there I am in. Don't worry about most of the junk in here. If you came to the master class, you'd understand it all, but we don't have time here. All we've got is who's the issuer? It is, and I'll do that, the issuer is my ADFS server. So the ADFS server has issued the token, and we've actually seen the UPN is john at one.ad.xtshub.com. So that is actually my user that has been authenticated against the on-premise AD. Okay. So that's that bit, and what we now need to do is actually publish this out through um, the portal. But let's move, first of all, onto the internet. So this is my pseudo internet. So OK that. And now take that up full screen, and here we go. Oh, it doesn't work. Well, that's to be expected. It's not going to work because we haven't published it through a zero AD yet. So let's go across, first of all, over to Zero AD, and then we want to go to Applications again, Add, and again, we're going to go Publish an Application the Accessible from Outside the Network. So we're going to go for that option, and we're going to give it uh, a name. So I'm going to call this one OIDC ADFS, so OpenID Connect ADFS Proxy. The internal URL, this time, I've actually got a DNS routable uh, internal URL, and I'm going to use the same internal and external URLs. So there's my OIDC ADFS in there. And I'm going to use my pre-authentication method, which is Azure AD. Let that whirl away for a bit, and then we'll need to complete the configuration. And what we need to do is just check on the URLs. I need the same external URL in this particular case as I do have internally. Now, what it's done is it's defaulted. So what we can see in there is we've got the default external URL, and over here we've got the internal URL. So the default one's no good to me at the moment. So what I need to do is clean that up. So I go in here, so OIDC ADFS. So same, so we're not going through that. And I need to choose my domain name. Remember, these domain names have to be verified into the Azure AD. OK, at this point in time, I now have uh, the same external URL as the internal URL, which is down the bottom. OK, so they're the same. OK, so. Having done that, what we need to do is we need to grab this CNAME redirect that we're going to do. And what's going to happen is we're going to connect to OID, uh, OIDC ADFS.1. etc. And what it wants us to do is actually go to OIDC ADFS 
tenant name, msproxy.net. So I'm going to click Save on that. And while that's cooking, all right, and saving, let's go across to what I call my ISP DNS, right? And I've got a placeholder in there already for me. So there's the OIDC ADFS.1.AD, et cetera. And I've got just a field that says replace. So I'm going to pop in where it needs to be sent to. We'll top and tail that because I picked up the quotes in there. Let's just take that up for those at the back. So now what we're doing is when we go to that external URL, we, we actually is C-named now to the msproxy.net um, fully qualified domain name. OK, so that's done. So we're progressing well. Um, we need to go back over here, and we need to make sure we've got a certificate. Well, I've already loaded the certificate up. So I, I have a certificate already up there, um, and it was loaded before when I was doing some testing. So it's star.1.ad.xtshub. So that will work with this external URL. So we have a certificate. So everything is looking good, except what? What do we need to do before it's going to work? We need to assign a user, yeah. So we're going to go and assign my user, John, to that. So we're using John Williams again. So we come down to John Williams here, assign the user. And once that's cooked, we should be good to go. So. Let's go over here, and now we're going to our OIDC ADFS, and we're going to log in. So we're logging in now to get through the pre-authentication. We hit the application, and now we're going to select the hybrid flow, which is going to cause authentication to happen again. But remember, this guy trusts ADFS. All right, so what's going to happen? We've gone to the proxy for ADFS. So we're outside, so we've gone to the ADFS proxy, so we log in at John, at this rather strange name, 1.ad.xtshub.com, and supplies password, sign in, and there we are. And if we look down here, we've actually got the certificate, the, the actual JSON web token for the application has been issued by the ADFS server. So let's, uh, let's switch back over here and just look at the inconvenience of this, if you like. And the inconvenience of this is that if we're going to do it, we've got to publish that ADFS server so it's available outside. You cannot publish the ADF, ADFS server through the Azure AD application proxy. It has to use the web application proxy that comes as part of ADFS. Or it's, um... OK, so that's that bit done. Let's, um, let's progress on, and let's look at how we actually manage a, um, another scenario, which is a claims application that actually trusts Azure AD. So what's going to happen here is we're going to come to the front door, knock, 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 pre-authentication. All right. Remember when we pre-authent, what do we get? We get a cookie, cookie all right, which says we're authenticated to Azure AD. All right. So now we come down through the connector, we hit the app, and the app trusts Azure AD. So where does it send us? To Azure AD to authenticate. What do we present to Azure AD? The cookie. So we're straight in, and we've got straight through single sign-on to our app. And I, I'm not going to show you how to set this up, but what I am going to show you is just the user experience of this. So um, let me just get that set up. OK. So the user experience of this is when I'm going to my OIDC app, which actually trusts Azure AD. So up to the port, this is pre-authentication taking place. 
and we log in with the correct credentials, would help. And now we hit, remember, we come through, this page is anonymous, right? So this page is presented back, and when we choose one of these options, we do the authentication. So now we choose the hybrid flow to do the authentication, and we're straight through. But if we have a look at this this time, who issued the token to the application? It was sts.windows.net. It was the Azure AD. So that's that working. So we got SSO working perfectly there. And that's, that's the, the scenario that we see there. So how could we fix the other one where our internal app is trusting ADFS? Imagine you've done this for a number of years now and you've got lots of applications internally trusting ADFS and, and then you've got this horrible single sign-on appearing twice. So, yes, so well, I, think, I think, yeah, it, it, maybe it's a bit of terminology difference, but I think I know. So what we can do is we can actually tell Azure AD that this user is a federated user, which means to authenticate this user, you need to go down to your on-premise ADFS server. All right? So what happens now is we come knock, knock, knocking on the front door to get through the pre-authentication, and this guy says, huh, all right, up to AD, all right, Azure AD, up to the Azure AD. And the Azure AD looks at John at blah, 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 blah. Ha, huh, you're a federated user. That means I need to send you down to your corporate STS to authenticate. So off John goes to the corporate STS to authenticate. And what does he get? He gets a cookie, all right? And then we're back to the... Azure AD, it knows we're authenticated because we've returned a token from our on-premise AD. So the Azure AD issues a token to get us through the pre-authentication. Now we hit the application, all right? And when the application says you're not authenticated, off you go to ADFS. And we're already authenticated, so it's SSO, all right? So let's just show the user experience of that. I've got a different environment here where I can show that in happening. So what I need to do is just switch over to that there. And okay, so this is, we're going to go and this is a federated user now. We're gonna go and hit that OIDC ADFS. Right, we're gonna select our user, right? And rather than being given a password prompt, it's redirecting us. And where's it redirecting us to? Our proxy for our ADF, corporate ADFS site. And it's already pre-populated the, uh, uh, the, the uh, username in there, which is very nice of it. So what we do is we put in our password and now we've signed in. Now we've got through pre-authentication, all right? So the pre-authentication up to the Azure AD, recognize John as a federated user, down to your corporate STS, log into your corporate STS, back to Azure AD. Azure AD then says, ah, yes, good, authenticated user. I'll issue a token to get you through the pre-authentication. So we're now through the pre-authentication. And now having got through the pre-authentication, We've hit the anonymous page, hit the hybrid flow, and there we are, straight in. Single sign-on, all right? We haven't had to sign it in again, and who issued the token? It's ADFS. And you think, ah, but does it work the other way, where the app trusts? So this is the one where the application is actually trusting Azure AD. So what's happening now is we're still getting the redirect down because we're a federated user, and now we authenticate and we go back. So now we've got through this app, trust Azure AD, okay, as its uh, security token service. So now we hit that hybrid flow, and there we are. The token is issued, and who issued the token? It is Azure AD, the scs.windows.net. So I think you can see there's an awful lot of ways that you can...
cut this thing. <laughs> um, and there, you know, so for those people that already have apps that are trusting on-premise ADFS, you say, well, hang on a minute, it's a lot of work to move all those and trust AD, Azure AD. You can work around it this way, right? There's, there's lots and lots and lots of different things that we can actually do to, to work around. Where are we? Yep. Okay. So, I've shown you claims where applications. I've shown you Windows auth applications. Claims applications, we got SSO, all right? And remember that if we've got multiple applications, once we've authenticated once, we've got access to all those applications, right? Because we've already authenticated with the zero AD. So imagine you hit one proxy endpoint, all right? Off to a zero AD, get a token to get you through that proxy endpoint. All right? And then you hit another proxy endpoint, up to a zero AD, but you have a cookie, you pass the cookie, and then you're through that. So it's once you've gone through to one, you basically got SSO to absolutely everything. So <clears throat> another thing you might have is you might have a forms-based app. And there's a sort of workaround where we can actually use password vaulting to fill in the form for you. All right? I'm just going to say it's, it's not the most elegant solution, but it does work. Rich client web apps are supported as well. And then other apps, if you have other apps, how do you support them? Well, one of the things you could do is you could support them through remote desktop publishing. All right? So we can authenticate to remote desktop gateway and then gain access to the apps. But something very interesting has happened, and we've got the ability now to integrate with ping access, or will have, shortly. And if we look at the, this is sort of exciting news, that Microsoft have partnered with ping access. And what ping access does is it sits either as a gateway, all right, and it's a gateway to multiple applications, or it sits as an agent on a web server. So if it was sitting on a uh, IIS web server, it would be an ISAPI filter as an agent. If it was sitting on an Apache server, you know, it would be a module that's sitting on the Apache server. And so we come through the connector using OpenID Connect and then actually authenticate to the ping access gateway or module and what that does is it takes the information out of the JSON web token and it builds an authentication header based on a set of rules that you define. All right? And if necessary, it will build cookies as well. So what it's doing is actually taking the information in the JSON web token and just crafting it so it will, you will be able to support many more applications that use authentication headers. So that's a, a really good benefit. And then if we sort of beyond the exciting changes, if you want to find out more, if you have a look at um, that particular URL there, which will get you started with application proxy, if you want a lot of technical detail, um, there's the troubleshooting white paper I wrote for the product group uh, a while back. Uh, I would, one thing I would say is just remember the uh, initial pre-authentication flow. Uh, if, if you want to know how 80% of people are using it, it's as in these slides I just showed you, and it's sort of a, a, a smaller percentage is using the code flow, which is currently in the white paper. All right. Um, so that's that. Um, and I've, I've got an identity masterclass. I must give that a plug. Unfortunately, it's not running over here at the moment. It is running in the UK, and it's also running in Norway. And, and we spend four days doing all this great stuff with Open ID Connect, and it's great. I love it. Uh, and I think most people that come on it love it too by the time they're finished. It's, they're tricky protocols to get a handle on, but once you get a handle on, you think, actually, what was hard about that? Because once you understand the flows. Um, also, consultancy, there's my Twitter. If you want to sign up, I will, as I say, I will do this, send out that paper on how to build the test environment in probably about three weeks, because I've got to update it for ADFS 20, not ADFS, I've got to update it for server 2016, because it was running TP4 
in the initial build. Um, and um, the only other thing to say is, if I can get there, this mouse is very sticky, is valuations are extremely important. Uh, I read absolutely every one, so if you want to write something in the evaluation, that's really nice in terms of, uh, you know, something useful. Because I'm always taking feedback from these sessions to try and make them better and better. Thank you for coming.